welcome to the Sankalp Forum panel on Reading Maharashtra's MSMEs, hosted by Purpose and the Maharashtra State Innovation Society. We're very excited to bring you this panel today to celebrate the potential of Maharashtra's MSME sector and to lay out a pathway to a greener, more climate resilient sector. Uh, before we begin, we have a few housekeeping points for you. This panel will be 90 minutes long, will include time for questions, so please add those to the chat when you are prompted to do so. Uh, we have four speakers, as you can see, and one moderator with us today, and we will introduce them shortly. Please make sure you're keeping yourself on mute during the duration of the panel. Um, before I begin, I wanted to introduce my organization. My name is Sonali Basin, and I am a strategist at Purpose. We are one of the co-hosts of today's panel. Um, as part of Purpose's work with Climate Voices, which is a communications hub consisting of ASAR, Climate Trends, and Purpose, of course, we aim to engage new and important constituencies in Maharashtra in a conversation about climate to amplify solutions at the state of the state's climate issues and encourage key stakeholders to invest in them. We are a social impact creative agency and a campaigning organization. We work with businesses, foundations, nonprofits, and international agencies to design campaigns that mobilize audiences uh, and create impactful movements. In India, we've been working on air pollution, renewable energy, and sustainable mobility and biodiversity in much more in the last six years. In Maharashtra, a state with cutting edge environmental commitments, our work is focused on the industrial sector and specifically on MSMEs which is why we're thrilled to host this panel today. And I am now going to pass this on to Shloka of the India Climate Collective, who will introduce our panel and act as our moderator. Thanks very much, Sonali. Um, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you all for taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you to Sankalp for inviting me to moderate this very crucial discussion on greening Maharashtra's MSME sector and of course purpose. Uh, thank you again. Um, as Sonali said, my name is Shloka Nath, and um, I'm the acting director of the India Climate Collaborative. Um, the micro, small, and medium enterprises, or the MSME sector as we know it, is actually the backbone of the country's economy. Not only does the sector contribute nearly 30% to GDP, but the six core MSMEs in the country also promote inclusive growth by providing employment to around 11 crore people. In the next five to six years, MSMEs are envisaged to contribute 50% to India's GDP. As these staggering numbers highlight our resilience on MSMEs, it's time we talk about transitioning, transitioning MSMEs to a low carbon sustainable development pathway. As larger Indian corporations begin to set ambitious climate commitments, it's clear that the next step in decarbonizing the industry is the transition of MSMEs to greener operations and products, and so a greener supply chain. Yet, when it comes to meeting climate commitments and transitioning to low carbon sustainable development, there is no strategic roadmap to empower MSMEs to deal with that transition risk. Even as global demand and supply chains swiftly shift to greener environmental friendly processes and products while capitalizing on newly generated business opportunities. Industry in a large state such as Maharashtra has the necessary resources, expertise and motivation at its disposal to become sustainable with a constant direction setting from the state government. Large industries and commercial ventures can be serviced by MSMEs and startups within the state for their requirements of green supply chains energy efficiency, process re-engineering and consulting. And recent trends indicate that this is actually on the rise. This presents the opportunity to the business community in Maharashtra to come together and create a vibrant, homegrown ecosystem of products and services for industry decarbonization and resilience to impacts and shocks. MSMEs will have a key role to play, thus creating opportunities for entrepreneurs, youth, as well as the enterprising citizens of our state. I think what's crucial to point out here is that the MSME sector, despite its rapid and recent growth, was stressed even before the COVID-19 pandemic due to headwinds from cheap imports, inefficient supply chains, low quality products, and the high cost of capital. The lockdowns have devastated the MSMEs, with production halted for months, limited or no sales, and dried up credit. In May 2020, Prime Minister Narendra Modi launched the Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan, exhorting citizens to be vocal for local, indicating a strategic shift in focus to robust domestic production and supply chains and a cautious outlook towards international trade. MSMEs in India form a crucial part of domestic and international supply chains of larger corporates, and this offers a golden opportunity for their revival. 
So transitioning to a cleaner energy system, such as rooftop solar, especially localized at the cluster levels, and increasing awareness and building capacity to enhance energy efficiency of MSMEs will lower expenses and emissions while increasing their cost competitiveness and help them integrate faster with the economic mainstream. Maharashtra is a hub of industrial production for India and is pioneering cutting edge environmental commitments that will set the trend for the rest of the country. For the state to meet these low carbon commitments, industries must green their businesses. Studies carried out in Maharashtra show that the MSME sector will struggle to do so without policy and financial support. Impact investing and the rise of ESG criteria is a fast growing opportunity to decarbonize the industry sector. So this confluence of factors presents the opportunity to the business community in Maharashtra it's an opportunity to come together to create, as I said, a vibrant homegrown ecosystem of products and services, and one that's truly resilient to impacts and shock. Our panel today brings together experts from ESG financing, from investment, from service provision, and industry bodies to share their tools and recommendations for the transformation of Maharashtra's MSM. So with that, I think we can actually move on to our panel discussion for this morning. I take great pleasure in introducing our panelists. We have with us Dr. Nand Kumar, the founder and managing director of the Chemtrolls Group. We have Tushar Devidyal. He's the founder and CEO of Devidyal Solar Solutions Private Limited. We also have Mithun John. He's the joint CEO at the Maharashtra State Innovation Society, the nodal agency under the Department of Skill Development, Employment and Entrepreneurship to support startups in Maharashtra. And finally, last but not least, we have Smita Hari. She's the Vice President of Sustainable Finance and ESG at Octus ESG LLP in there. So with that, Smita, I'm actually gonna start off with you. Um, I'd love for you to introduce a little bit more about yourself and the work that you're doing at Octus ESG. And if you can also talk about the most important tool or gap from your perspective that's needed for MSMEs to convert to low carbon operations in Maharashtra. Sure, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Shloka, for that uh, introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thanks uh, for having me here and uh, to be a part of this panel. And it's a pleasure to be discussing on this very pertinent topic. Uh, so just to give a little bit of introduction about myself, my name is Smita Hari. I'm a finance professional with about uh, over 15 years of experience, both on the corporate side as well as the uh, as being an entrepreneur. So I have worked across uh, sustainable finance, ESG, impact investing, uh, business strategy, research, and investment banking uh, in organizations like ING, EY, Marsh & McLennan, and uh, uh, Spark Capital and Investment Bank. I've also donned uh, the entrepreneurial hat for a brief bit in my career, uh, handling assignments on go-to-market strategies and working on research papers uh, relating to impact investing, private equity, and venture capital funding. Uh, currently, I'm a prior vice president at Optus ESG LLP, like Shloka introduced. Uh, so Optus is basically a global advisory firm uh, in the areas of uh, sustainable finance, ESG, and climate strategy. Optus works on uh, design and delivery of uh, sustainable finance products, climate and green finance, uh, advisory on ESG risk and resilience, and curating knowledge products for global markets. Uh, so jumping into today's uh, you know, topic, so uh, the MSME sector is a major contributor to the socioeconomic development of the country. And in recent years, uh, uh, the sector has gained significant importance because of its contribution to the country's GDP and exports. So as uh, Shloka mentioned, uh, the uh, sector contributes about 30% of country's GDP, close to 50% of exports in 2021. Uh, and Maharashtra being the economic powerhouse, uh, you know, has the fourth highest concentration of MSMEs in the country, with a total of, of about close to 48 lakh businesses, most of which are micro enterprises. And uh, so this roughly translates to about 8% of the 6.3 odd crore MSMEs in the country. The state is also one of the largest employers uh, in the sector after uh, Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal and Tamil Nadu. So however, being, uh, despite being the growth engine of the state that it is, uh, the sector is plagued with you know, multiple challenges, uh, including lack of access to capital, weak balance sheets, project execution delays, uh, inability to uh, source resources at a competitive price, dearth of talent, et cetera. Uh, additionally, the single entrepreneur or owner paradigm you know, creates its own hurdles, uh, hurdles uh, giving uh, rise to extreme dependencies on people uh, you know, rather than processes. 
So the pandemic has brought with it, as we all know, uh, all know our own, its own challenges for the sector. Maharashtra specifically was worst hit uh, due to COVID-19, and it is yet to see a complete turnaround on small businesses. So given the challenging environment, you know, it is critical that the sector aligns to an inclusive and sustainable model to be able to grow successfully. However, we see that financing sustainability continues to be on the back burner when it comes to MSMEs. And the lack of adequate uh, and timely access to capital to invest in clean technologies and energy efficient measures tops the list of MSME challenges. And it continues to be you know, the biggest gap on the path of, to greening the MSMEs. Uh, with the effects of climate change uh, by MSMEs and for MSMEs, in fact, you know, it cannot be disputed. Much of it was seen in recent times. Uh, India is the third largest uh, emitter of carbon dioxide in the world, and uh, the manufacturing sector in the country contributed to about 300 uh, million metric tons of carbon dioxide, of which the MSME sector was about 135 million metric tons. Uh, this was a per annum number. Uh, similarly, its vulnerability to climate change risks is evident from the disruption in supply chains on the back of climate hazards. Therefore, financing uh, climate solutions in MSMEs is critical, which is currently not sufficient. So what is it that can we do to make MSMEs climate actions more bankable? You know, banks are the predominant source of debt finance for uh, the sector, and they have a mandate to, uh, by RBI to lend to the PSL under the PSL segment. However, we see it's difficult for banks to meet this requirement. So pre-COVID, you know, financial institutions were seen to have limited exposure to MSMEs because of a whole host of you know, challenges which I had mentioned uh, before. And adding to these complicated procedures, entrepreneurs lack of financial knowledge itself you know, of the schemes available, et cetera. However, last year after COVID uh, happened, uh, there has been an up upsurge in MSME lending, uh, purely because the government of uh, India came up with the emergency credit line guarantee scheme for MSMEs. And it's seen a sanctions of you know, close to 2.86 lakh crores uh, till end of September 2021, and primarily focused on the stress sectors. So the various uh, stimulus packages announced by India uh, may not have been earmarked towards sustainable sectors. However, a substantial chunk uh, would have certainly gone in an indirect manner. Uh, and the collateral-free nature of the program itself has kind of helped many MSMEs. But this is far from sufficient. You know? Therefore, apart from traditional options of debt, equity, direct grants and stimulus practices, there is a need to introduce innovative alternative financing mechanisms to stimulate the low carbon measures and promote energy efficiencies. So risk guarantees, blended finance structures, innovative bond structuring, uh, venture capital funding, credit link subsidies, uh, all these are required you know, to kind of stimulate flow to the uh, flow of finance to the sector. So I'll touch upon some of these aspects later in the discussion uh, and I'd like to stop for now. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mita. That was really, um, I think, uh, really well put because you've kind of sort of summed up one of the most crucial gaps, which is, of course, the financial gap. Um, and I actually, Dr. Nankumar, I'm going to turn to you. Um, you, of course, are, you know, not only the founder and managing director of the Chemtrolls Group, but you're also the chairman of the CII MSME subcommittee. And perhaps, sir, you can shed some light as well on what Smita was referring to. I know CII has been very active in preparing, of course, a lot of um, tools, especially financial tools for MSME um, and promoting, you know, more sustainable financial business models. Would love to hear your work there. And if you can also answer the question of, you know, about what you think is the most important tool or gap uh, for MSMEs to convert to low carbon operations. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Thank you. First, I would, I would like to thank uh, Sankalp as well as the Purpose and Indian Climate Coordinators for this great opportunity. And also thank for uh, your painstaking efforts to make this uh, uh, session very interactive as well as very sustainable uh, for the MSMEs. At the outset, I would like to introduce myself as a chemical engineer way back in 1970 and spent nearly 45, 47 years um, in the industry in operation of refineries, petrochemicals, where of course a large amount of uh, pollution uh, abatement, et cetera, comes into picture. And at the same time, I'm running my own industry since 1975. 
nearly 45 years, uh, manufacturing, instrumentation, automation, and also now diversified into solar energy and uh, other areas which are uh, renewable as well as new areas. So I would say we have been in right from the beginning, um, very responsive company, even from my own setup, plus my own activity in the industrial sectors with um, various industry associations. I'm very active in CII, FIKI, ASOCHAM, as well as Process Plan Missionary Association. So we promote, um, we promote MSME's requirements as well as also sustainable operations in relations to uh, in today's major subject of the climate change and climate control. Now, before uh, going into that, I would say that both CII and all other industry associations are very, very focused on MSMEs. MSMEs in terms of finance, in terms of technology upgradation, in terms of skill development, and in terms of overall, I would say, sustainable operations, which we consider as three Ps people, planet, and of course, the prosperity. From that point of view, I would say contribution of the industry associations is much, much higher than uh, any other uh, industry bodies which we can think localized. Yet, there are quite a lot of things to be done as uh, you all know that it is nearly 12 million, uh, uh, 12 million units, uh, 64 million units and 12 million, uh, 12, 20 million people are employed. And beyond that, in the last uh, year, that is on 1st July, a new definition has come into picture in MSME, by which um, it is not only a manufacturing, it's also service sectors are added. And last July, this July, uh, I believe in 7th, in addition to service, they also added some amount of like um, wholesale and retail dealers. So which means the MSME sector as a whole is going to be much more bigger than 64 million, what it used to be, I'm sure, much, much higher. So this gives you quite a good challenges at the same opportunities in creating the employment and in creating the and enhancing the developments. And coming back to today's subject, um, uh, one of the critical subjects me that touched upon the finance for MSMEs, I fully agree, it is still a working process going on. The big challenge, which is one critical area, which is that, you know, Reserve Bank of India has um, uh, sometime back, uh, I believe in 2015 has brought a non, what is known as IRAC, income recognition and asset classification, by which, uh, an industry which is drawing beyond five crores has gone only 90 days to perform. Beyond uh, 90 days, they become an NPA. So that's a subject which we take up because it's a very, very uh, important uh, situation for MSMEs to sustain, especially over the last two years, though government has given, but as you rightly said, the economic slowdown started much before the COVID. So there are issues coming up and, and in the MSME, scenario in the ecosystem, the manufacturing companies are very small. Even today, it is only around less than 32%. For a developing country like India, manufacturing has to be certainly beyond 25% uh, of the GDP, whereas today it is uh, less than 15%. So we have quite a lot of work to enhance the manufacturing contribution to the GDP, as well as to make it uh, India the, in the global value chain. Last month, uh, August, uh, our prime minister has said that we have a $400 billion target for um, this year exports. And we have done over the last uh, six months, April to September, we have done 197 billion. So we are on the, we are on top, but yet we have to do quite a lot of work because we need to create our global supply chain into the, into the share, India's share into global supply chain has to considerably go. So there is quite a lot of work. And coming to Maharashtra, I would say, I must compliment Maharashtra because, you know, there was a report which is a pilot report was prepared by the uh, Commerce and Industry Ministry in 2018 and which was supported by the Asian Development Bank. As per that, they had they were publishing a report known as uh, IPRS, which is uh, Industrial uh, Park Rating System. And a first report has come around uh, two weeks back. It was released by the Commerce and Industry Minister, uh, Mr. Som Prakash and Maharashtra stands the tallest. I believe out of 68 uh, industry leaders in there, 27 are from Maharashtra. So Maharashtra's industrial MIDC certainly contributes in creating, and the base of that IPRS is one is competitiveness, and the other is sustainability. So in sustainability covers what we talk of environment as well as social and governance. So in my opinion, Maharashtra stands tall. There is quite a lot of work done, still continues to work. Before I go into much more detail, a couple of areas which I would say that one, I would say is the MIDC has looked at MI, MI, MSME's critical financial situation, uh, planning to introduce a couple of new initiatives, which the gap is there. One is the, especially on the pollution side, they are looking at, can we have an 
common steam system delivered to steam consumers. Because each and every MSME produces steam, put a boiler, then it is very difficult to control the pollution. So they are looking at how we can have a, a common boiler system across an industrial park and distribute the steam superheated or uh, uh, saturated steam depending upon the requirements. That is in a working process. I must say that will really be a great service, not only to become competitive, also to reduce the climate uh, issues coming up. Another area which they are looking at this common, and as a cluster development program, they have also brought up the common facility center, CFCs. And in the common facility center, which is are operating in, uh, I would say in basic technology based on which was there in operation for the last 15 years, 20 years, and individuals, there are a lot of issues coming up because uh, the discharge to the effluents varies from industry units to it. Now they are also looking at that common facility, common facility center, that is an effluent treatment plants to get it modernized and upgraded with the technology, which is one of the, I would say, multi-effective operation system by which any type of influence coming in can be properly controlled at lower cost and which, and also generate the uh, water for consumption. So I would say Maharashtra is taking quite a lot of initiative in, in enhancing the MSMEs to meet the climate control and meet India's commitment to COP20. Now again, it is coming up in November. So I would say the Indian, MSMEs, especially the Maharashtra on the on the top side or on the on the highest highest side in creating the environment as in creating the uh, ecosystem for having a complete cleaner production program not only on continuous process industries but also for which are not producing like engineering auto auto components couple of areas where they are looking at is um, uh, in order to reduce the fossil fuel, can we also look at either store battery storage solar system energies or fuel cells? And fuel cells is going to, because hydrogen energy is going to come in the coming five years, the hydrogen. So they are also looking at, can we not introduce fuel cells? And I would say that, as I said, my own company does um, air quality monitoring systems, continuous air quality monitoring stations. And in, in the state of... In the state of Maharashtra, MMRDA, we are doing great work on that. So I would say though also we are now looking at reducing the carbon footprint by having fuel cells. Thank you. Here I will stop now. I will come back to you. Thank you, Sloka. Thank you, Dr. Nankumar. That was, I think, a really informative you know, analysis and summary of, I think, a, a number of issues that MSMEs are facing. I think it's heartening that you, of course, feel that Maharashtra, as you said, stands tall. But I think two things that you highlighted that are really crucial, of course, are the need for competitiveness and, of course, sustainable business models again. Um, Tushar, coming to you next, just putting on a slightly different hat here, you know, basis the work that you're doing, which is really exciting, because the MSME sectors I mentioned, of course, were struggling before. Um, but it is primed for transformation as they recover from you know, current economic shocks because they are going to be instrumental in India meeting its clean energy targets. And what is required, of course, is capacity building for the adoption of energy efficient technologies and processes by MSMEs. And there is you know, a big need to support clean tech startups. They are the missing link in scaling sustainability solutions and climate finance is a great starting point, um, you know, given that they currently struggle to re receive, of course, commercial capital at attractive rates as our panelists have mentioned just, just prior to you. So would love to hear from you as the founder and CEO, of course, of David Dial Solar Solutions, the work that you've been doing. Um, and if in answer, while answering that, you can also take us through what you feel again is one of the largest gaps uh, facing the MSME sector and what will spur that conversion to low carbon uh, pathways for them in Maharashtra. Over to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Shloka. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, thanks for having me at this forum. I'm going to pull up a slide uh, to keep in the background while I while I talk about uh, the issue at hand. So my name is Tushar. I'm the founder and CEO of Davidel Solar Solutions Private Limited. And what we do is we design and manufacture solar refrigerators. Uh, these are highly efficient, uh, energy efficient, need uh, small solar panels, small batteries, and are completely off-grid. So uh, they would reduce demand on the grid where needed and provide uh, continuous cooling where there's power shortages, load shedding, or even in a complete off-grid area. Uh, we're based in Mumbai, in Maharashtra, uh, and we have sales all over India and also in East Africa. 
most of our solar refrigerators are targeted at solving cold chain issues in agriculture, dairy, uh, fish retail, and veterinary vaccine storage. Over the past two or three years, we've uh, uh, lab tested our solar refrigerators against international standards and uh, we're proud to say that we were finalists of the Global Leap Award in 2019 and more importantly for us as a company we won the consumer affordability prize. So uh, looking at the slide what you see on the left is a frozen fruit pulp storage case. Uh, this, uh, this is in the tribal belt of southern Rajasthan. Um, we enabled uh, this tribal community to store sitafal and jamun pulp. These are non-timber forest products that are picked by tribal women. It's a seasonal, uh, seasonal activity. It's a livelihood that contributes tremendously to this community. And it was failing because of a lack of continuous power. Uh, decentralized cold storage has uh, generated in this case over 300 seasonal jobs as well as uh, resulted in lower spoilage and loss. Uh, coming back to, um, to, to Maharashtra, uh, we find that there are several such value chains available in Maharashtra. Um, there could be a fish retail uh, value chain uh, in say coastal Ratnagiri or uh, Sindhu Durg on the western coast of India. Now, these are again power consuming, power hungry activities because there's a recurring cost of commercial ice. Ice in Maharashtra is largely made uh, using diesel gensets. And there you have the emissions, the climate issues, et cetera. When you go to a solar freezer or solar fridge to retail fish, there's a number of cross, uh, I would say cross uh, uh, benefits in, in that you have a climate benefit, you have a reduction in spoilage and wastage, and then you're creating a, a livelihood. Generally, in the case of fish retail, as you see in some of the pictures above, it's, it's a gender-focused livelihood. Uh, similarly, in goat milk in Maharashtra, uh, it's a large opportunity, especially for, uh, for women. Um, when it comes to Maharashtra and MSMEs and greening the sector, according to me as a practitioner who struggled through COVID, uh, I, I would say, you know, it boils down to one word, money. Um, greening the sector has to be profitable or at least profit neutral. Uh, MSMEs are stressed uh, to put an additional burden of environment. Uh, while it's critical for me as a person, for me as a, for us as a business, uh, we got to make it uh, really achievable. And, and, and that comes down to money. So, so what, what uh, Smita had mentioned about the ECLGS, which is the emergency COVID relief given by the government, I think that needs to be scaled up, taken one step further, and then maybe I'll, I'll talk about it in subsequent remarks about how I believe uh, end user financing fits into this. So with that, um, thank you. Thanks, Tashar. The slide was excellent and I think really interesting um, to sort of just dive a bit into the work that you're doing. It's um, fascinating and I'm sure also very rewarding just as it is difficult. But I think your point on, um, you know, capital again is crucial that, you know, the, the greening of the economy really has to be financed and has to be profitable. Um, with that, Mithun, over to you. We'd love to hear a little bit more about the work that you're doing at MSINS. It's, you know, a nodal government agency that's looking to really drive or boost innovation, um, you know, in the state of Maharashtra. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about the work that you do over there from the policy perspective? And more importantly, again, you know, perhaps you can also bring that perspective to what you think are the most significant gaps um, you know, for MSMEs or the challenges that they're facing today? Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Sloka. And I'd like to thank the uh, Sankalp and team at Purpose for uh, giving us this platform to address this uh, very important issue of climate change. Uh, to start with, um, I've been a part of Maharashtra State Innovation Society for the last uh, three years in the capacity of the joint CEO, and it's been a great opportunity for somebody like me who's coming from the corporate sector, like most of you here, to uh, be a part of this initiative. We are under the uh, 
Department of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, Government of Maharashtra. And our mandate is to see how we can strengthen the startup ecosystem that currently exists. What are the new initiatives that we can launch to support the startups, as well as making sure that there is the right set of infrastructure that's available uh, to various entrepreneurs who uh, plan to start uh, in uh, Maharashtra. This also involves engaging very closely with various uh, partners that exist uh, in the ecosystem. So, uh, and we are, as an organization, very proactive in that manner, reaching out to various incubation centers, accelerators, the entire spectrum of VCs, as well as various uh, agencies, both uh, domestic as well as uh, international. So over the last uh, three, three and a half years that we have been existing, uh, I'd like to talk about one of the flagship events that uh, we currently host. And we, we just had the fourth edition, well as the Maharashtra Startup Week, uh, wherein uh, each year we identify 24 innovative products and services uh, across India and not just uh, Maharashtra. And we give each of these 24 startups a, a government work order, which means uh, it is uh, we are trying to be an early stage customer to these startups. It's, it's not a cash prize or a grant, but it's an opportunity for each of these 24 companies to validate their uh, product. And in a lot of cases, we have also ended up being the first customer to these uh, startups. So we, we back the risk. Uh, we fund this particular uh, pilot. And uh, we, we are in times where uh, there's a surplus amount of funding in the current times. If you look at the consumer focused uh, companies and the fast paced uh, businesses, but uh, quite clearly there's a dearth of capital when it comes to startups that are you know work, working on products and um, the kind of companies that are addressing solid waste or uh, energy or clean tech for that matter. So if you look at the startup week, uh, we are focused on sectors like agri, healthcare, education and skilling, sustainability, governance. So under sustainability, which uh, traditionally we have seen the largest number of applicants come to us from uh, sustainability. And uh, we have three subsectors. Uh, so there's air, uh, water and clean energy under uh, the sustainability. So uh, over the last four editions, we have facilitated a lot of pilots for these uh, startups. And what we do is we connect them with various beneficiary departments within the government of Maharashtra. And we try and, uh, so while we are giving a foot in the door to these 24 startups, what we are also trying to bring about is innovation within various government departments. So we are trying to introduce these uh, startups to see how uh, the government can make use of these innovations, which they may not be traditionally uh, aware of. So that's the kind of role we are trying to play, for which reason we don't restrict it to just startups from Maharashtra. So the, the leadership uh, at the government of Maharashtra has been open enough to uh, allow startups from across India to be a part of this forum. And we, we get about 2,000 uh, applications each year where we... Uh, you know, filter down to uh, arrive at the top uh, 24. Some of the noticeable pilots or startups that we have, and Tushar did mention about the high pollution that comes out of these industries. So one company that's, uh, so there are about three, four examples that I would like to quote you. One was uh, a company based out of uh, the NCR called as Chakra, which addresses issue of uh, the dense amount of smoke. So they have developed a product which brings down the particulate the particulate matter from DG sets to the extent of 70%. So we help them pilot the solution at the MTDC resorts uh, in Maharashtra. So we funded that pilot for them. Uh, another one is uh, called as Pad Care, which uh, addresses a very important uh, area of uh, recycling sanitary napkins. So we in fact installed hundred of their uh, devices at uh, Mantrale uh, a couple of months back and we are funding this uh, pilot and th there's been uh, we were one of the early uh, customers to them and as we speak larger corporates like Infosys, Mahindra have already onboarded them for uh, this uh, particular uh, solution. There's another startup called as ReCity which uh, we, we connected them to the uh, Maharashtra Pollution Control Board 
And through them, we worked on EPR, which is uh, a very important aspect, uh, extended producer liability for responsibility for a lot of corporates. So through them, we worked, uh, we funded a pilot for them where uh, we were uh, recycling close to 600 tons uh, of waste. Uh, so these are some of the uh, pilots we have uh, executed through the Maharashtra Startup Week, where the Innovation Society has introduced uh, you know, uh, innovative startups into various departments within the uh, government of Maharashtra. And what we have also seen of late is uh, newer, uh, more departments coming forward. So to put an example, the Pollution Control Board came forward and said, we see this whole, we recognize the value that startups are adding to this area. And they committed close to about a million dollars to fund pilots on various problem statements that uh, you know, the departments are facing. There's another grand challenge that we are launching with the fisheries department with a with a commitment a little lesser than that, about five to six tools, again, to solve problems. So that's a noticeable change that we are seeing that there are more departments coming forward to fund uh, such pilots uh, as we go forward. Another policy, which I'm sure a lot of you may be uh, aware of, is the uh, EV policy that was launched by the uh, environment department. So uh, my understanding is if you look at uh, an Aether scooter, so between the fame subsidy, flame subsidy, as well as the subsidy given by the government of Maharashtra, chances are it's uh, probably the cheapest uh, or amongst the cheapest uh, in any state in India. So there's a very, fairly strong uh, EV policy now and the intent uh, is very clear. And I'm sure all of us agree that EV is here to uh, stay uh, in terms of uh, you know, adaptation. Uh, there's also a, a fair amount of support given to uh, companies that are addressing the area of uh, charging infrastructure, uh, you know, which is a very important uh, aspect of the whole uh, EV game. And that's more like a chicken and egg uh, story. So the, the, the policy addresses this issue in terms of how you know, we can um, create support these early stage companies that are going about uh, creating the charging uh, infrastructure. Uh, Mumbai is now also part of the C40 cities, uh, which is a group, uh, which is a group of 100 global cities working towards driving faster action on climate change, uh, addressing various uh, areas like afforestation, solid waste management, and adaptation of EV and augmenting charging uh, infrastructure. Uh, beyond Mumbai, uh, the state has very recently announced the state wildlife action plan to focus on uh, undertaking massive uh, wildlife conservation across the state. So Maharashtra is probably amongst the early movers uh, to do so. And I'm sure this is all going a long way in ensuring Maharashtra's net zero commitments in the long term. Thank you, Mithun. I appreciate that. There's actually a lot embedded in what you said in terms of the amount that you're doing, um, you know, in, term, in, in building that in innovation ecosystem, of course, and also on the policy front. And I think that um, policy piece is something that's really crucial. We're going to come back to you on um, just in a bit, because I really want everyone to hear, you know, a little bit more about um, what are some of the recommendations that you're putting out there and how you're planning on using policies and instrument to drive some of this growth forward. Um, I'm going to actually come back to you uh, now, uh, just to sort of, you know, talk once again, Smita, uh, about the investment infrastructure. And the reason I want you to talk a little bit about that is because I know um, you and your company have pioneered green financial products in India. You're really focused on developing those credit lines towards green financing. Um, and I think, you know, while we have a sense that recommendations exist about how to drive growth within the MSME sector, that those recommendations need to be embedded into policy and investment specifically. Um, so would love to hear a little bit more from you on the investment side. I'm just going to make one request to all my panelists, which is we're running a little bit behind on time. So if you don't mind keeping your remarks, you know, a little short, um, you know, I want to make sure we get to everyone in this next round. But Smita, over to you. Please kick us sure. off. Thanks, uh, Shloka. So as I think most of my fellow panelists have told, capital and access to, you know, reliable financing is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, so while the MSME sector is, uh, it's, they're look, it's looking to be about 50% of India's GDP in the next 15, and 15 crore jobs in the next five to six years, 
that shows the amazing uh, amount of you know reliance on these uh, on the sector itself for the growth of the country however uh, expectations from msmes are low when it comes to meeting climate commitments and transitioning to a low carbon sustainable uh, development and even though global demand and supply chains are swiftly shifting to greener practices there's no strategic roadmap so to say uh, for msmes to deal with transition risks and most of the msmes are technically and financially constrained to invest in new interventions even if they recognize the business case you know for greening so this is where large companies can step in uh, to encourage greening of their supply chains. For example, earlier this year, Sibbi and Tata Power uh, joined hands to provide affordable financing for MSMEs in the rooftop segment, which are uh, for customers of Tata Power, basically. So by providing collateral free loans, interest rates, you know, uh, southwards of 10%. So climate finance as a topic is not uh, defined in India, and therefore there is no particular classification when it comes to financing projects that deal with you know, mitigation or uh, adaptation. And as I mentioned, priority sector lending is an, they can, could play an important role in uh, channeling green finance, but has proved to be largely inadequate and ineffective. Uh, and uh, as it was discussed earlier as well, you know, lack of understanding of sectoral risks by financiers policy uncertainties, uh, weak balance sheets, et cetera, can be hurdles to access mainstream finance. So what is it that we can do to kind of, uh, you know, uh, ensure that financing is not, uh, I mean, it will still remain in the most important need, but how can we kind of lessen the burden on MSMEs? So I would like, like to discuss four important uh, financing mechanisms in the context of what we are discussing today. Uh, first is on guarantees. So guarantees, uh, on one hand, they have reduced the risks uh, of investors and financiers, and on the other hand, uh, have helped users to develop a credit history, you know, which over time uh, has the potential to unlock financing for other needs as well. So basis uh, guarantees, financial institutions can provide concessional debt in the form of, you know, interest subsidies, waivers on down payments, longer repayment periods, uh, you know, to make the loans more accessible and affordable. Uh, so banks do use the credit guarantee fund trust for micro and small. So that's called uh, CGT MSC and guarantee schemes like uh, SIDB and BEE's, uh, you know, partial guarantees to financial institutions for energy efficient technologies. Uh, so thereby enabling financial institutions to offer loans at a lower uh, rate. Uh, the, basically, the guarantees are through ESCO, the energy service companies, guaranteeing about 70-75% of the loan amount. And uh, there is a fee charge to this. So guarantee schemes like this, uh, you know, uh, can help even newer MSMEs with less than adequate credit history to build the credit profile. Uh, so what we need is an effective guarantee scheme, now targeted towards climate aligned sectors that would kind of be an enabler in the SME lending ecosystem. And uh, certain DFIs have started pushing climate and reduced GHG emissions as a goal and uh, partnering with that, such DFIs with innovative guarantee structuring can help in uh, furthering the agenda uh, of the uh, greening the sector. So in fact, it is seen that financial leverage achieved with a small allocation of the guarantee fund can be significant, uh, you know, which in turn can lead to a sizable increase in the supply of loanable funds to uh, MSMEs. Uh, in fact, with respect to special reference to energy efficiency, which is kind of an important thing uh, in the greening uh, uh, goal, uh, formation of EESL uh, not only has fueled the energy efficiency market, but has also helped in mainstreaming financial flows across the supply chain, which includes SMEs at the base. Uh, the second uh, instrument which I want to talk about is, uh, it's not anything new, but it's uh, not often used. It's called uh, cash flow based finance, which you know helps resolve the working capital issues of the smaller entities. So the loan is actually backed by an SME's uh, existing and expected cash flows and repayments to banks are based on business projected uh, cash flows. And the debt covenants on these kinds of loans are focused on managing the levels of the interest rates. And, you know, so basically charting the cash flows helps in entering uh, the fixed cost, operating costs, accounts receivables, account payable, et cetera, into, you know, future weeks or months realistically. And such uh, financing is particularly relevant to cash generating enterprises, like, some, for example, suppliers of water ATMs, where, you know, the inflow is mainly in the form of, you know, cash or rather it's it's like an annuity based model blended finance is the third uh, i've been talking about I'll just keep it short because uh, uh, we're running out of time so this is where you know uh, the use of development finance or philanthropic funds are used to mobilize private capital 
uh, flows to borrowers, resulting in uh, positive results for both investors and uh, communities. And uh, so DFIs again can have a role to play here to provide such blended models in order to enable mainstream financing towards the solutions. And uh, the new upcoming DFI in India that uh, you know is planned to establish, they can consider such interventions. So basically, what happens is uh, you know you you have access to uh, some form of a grant capital which can be leveraged to get more of you know risk capital. So the pool itself becomes quite large uh, for the end customer. Uh, finally, I want to quickly touch upon bonds as an instrument. So green bonds are fast becoming a popular instrument uh, to finance uh, decarbonization goals. Uh, and although the issuance of a green bond by an MSME is challenging, mainly because of size constraints, the issuance of green bonds from, from banks that aggregate MSME loans and issuance of mini bonds you know, by medium-sized enterprises is a possibility. Uh, so under the topic of bonds, uh, labeled bonds by municipal bodies are, is another option. And that can be instrumental in unlocking private sector capital in a state like Maharashtra. Uh, so municipal bonds have already been successfully tried in the state. For example, Pune Municipal Corporation in 2017 issued a bond for the water sector. And for an, as another example, uh, so the city of Mumbai, uh, Mumbai, as you know, has seen the worst floods uh, during monsoon. Then it's only worsening. Uh, so clogged rivers, wetlands surrounding these uh, practically in non-existent uh, uh, barrages, etc. Now, issuing an adaptation bond under the municipal bonds category that SEBI has allowed, uh, BMC could channelize this capital uh, through, you know, PPPs. It can uh, direct it to, to MSMEs, which are working in these, uh, you know, segments. And given that BMC is cash rich, the investor's interest is inevitable in this segment. And finally, you know, aggregation and securitization of smaller sized green or climate aligned assets are quite relevant. Uh, so green securitization and standardization and uh, bundling of you know these options uh, into long term or lower cost funding in some of these markets now uh, so apart from the above so these are the four things i wanted to kind of delve deep and talk about apart from them uh, you know financing schemes like uh, zero defect zero effect credit linked capital subsidy for technology upgradation venture capital funding for energy efficiency uh, uh, programs then facilitation through supportive frameworks like you know credit options, pay as you go options. All these will provide the much needed uh, you know energy saving investments, and they will also help in production processes to reduce the carbon footprint and enhance profitability. So in a sense, uh, I just conclude saying that you know continuous measuring, monitoring, reporting of GHG emissions achieved either through energy efficiency uh, and better utilization of you know non polluting renewable energy. Coupled with uh, you know the right financing mechanisms, you know driven uh, at a at a top level uh, rather than from the MSME, that would be a step in the right direction to address this problem. Smitha, I think again brilliantly said. I think one of the things that I found the most interesting, of course, is when you were talking about the fact that green bonds themselves can be potentially utilized to dovetail with revival schemes. You know, there are so many measures, as you rightly said, to foster credit availability for MSMEs as well as other sectors. How do we make sure that they actually sync up and and, and obviously dovetail together? A lot to unpack again from what you said, but you know, I think you broke it down so well with those four points. I'm actually going to you know build on what you just said and, and move to Tushar, I want um, to bring his perspective in here because I do, Tushar, want you to talk just, you know, wearing your entrepreneurial hat as well. We've heard, you know, about the massive credit deficit and the need to sort of think about innovative financing uh, mechanisms. I'd love for you to talk to us a little bit now about how we might support the MSME sector to, you know, not just economically recover, but also rebuild when it comes to cleaner production, resource efficiency, you know, build in those circularity principles. How do we actually move MSMEs towards net zero? Um, you know, are we able to build in manufacturing systems, you know, with the ability to quickly adapt to similar disruptions in the future? What is it going to take, essentially, if you can... If you can sort of respond to that, sure. that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. I think, look, uh, both Nitin's comments uh, as well as Smita's comments uh, resonate. And uh, maybe as a practitioner in the trenches, I'll, I'll share, uh, uh, you know, what what I believe is important and how it's being implemented. So, so to the, uh, you know, Maharashtra State Innovation Society, I think one thing that uh, 
you know, there, there's so many programs, but one thing I really like about what they're doing is they, they take a real world problem and they create it, turn it into a question, and then they fund that work order. So Mithun briefly mentioned about the fish, uh, you know, collaborating with the fisheries department. There, you know, the various problem statements, how do we generate energy from fish waste? How do we reduce diesel consumption? You know, how do we add non-conventional energy into uh, jetties and harbors? And they're putting money right behind those statements. So if you're a MSME who has a solution for that, Mithun's company or Mithun's organization will give you a work order. So I think like more direct, uh, you know, solution-driven funding uh, is, is critical. And it's good to know that in Maharashtra, we're getting that. Um, now, you know, coming back, taking up a little bit of what uh, Smita was saying on uh, priority sector lending, a lot of risk guarantee and energy efficiency being critical. Um, yes, 100% uh, agree. What we see as a challenge uh, for our company in solar refrigeration, and this could be in solar water pumping as well, is not just us who need finance, but our consumers and our customers who need finance. So if it is a fish vendor or a Kirana shop or a, a someone who's storing a fruit pulp, these are micro entrepreneurs who need loans of 60,000 or 70,000 rupees. They're more than willing to adopt a new technology such as a solar refrigerator. They're more than willing to adopt a, you know, a three lakh rupee, say a solar water pump but they need that consumer financing. The, the same level of development behind uh, risk guarantees, priority sector that has come to the MSMEs as, uh, as Smith outlined, maybe needs to go down further to the consumer level. Now, Ashwa Finance, which is part of the Avishkar group is running a small scale pilot with us to get solar fridges to the end user with a risk guarantee and uh, I mean, I'm really happy that it's launched. We're, you know, we're, we're running with it. I want to see, I'll come back to maybe this team three, six months down the line to see if what I'm saying is empirically tested and works out. But um, uh, my point is this, is that uh, when you talk about finance support, it's not just MSMEs, but it's customers of MSMEs selling green products that eventually need to finance. So that I'll... No, thanks, Ashad. That again was, you know, brilliantly said. And I think you've summed it up, you know, superbly as well. Just a quick sort of um, question for you, an add-on actually. Um, you know, can incentive schemes, you know, you know, promotion of new champion sectors, you know, things like solar PV manufacturing, for instance, can we link those sectors with other sectors such as healthcare? Can that be leveraged for the generation of scalable green jobs that we need? Do you see yes, opportunities in those areas? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, this, this nexus of uh, renewable energy or distributed renewable energy with healthcare, the nexus of uh, renewable energy with livelihoods, uh, renewable energy with so many others. So it's, it's never just SDG 7 by itself. It's always SDG 7 and SDG 8, SDG 7 linked with something else, because renewable energy is just an enabler. Uh, you know, the the problem lies in something else, in either poverty, livelihoods, hunger, health, et cetera. So it has to be linked. There has to be a holistic approach. And again, I'm, I'm fairly positive. I, I, I feel privileged to live in Mumbai and in Maharashtra because you know guys get it. People are doing stuff. I think we need to plug in a little bit better, but it is happening. Thanks, Tushar. Yeah. Um, and with that, Mithun, I'm gonna to come to you next. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about the policy piece here. Um, specifically on this, on this score, can you tell us a little bit about the state's larger goals? Um, you know, how is the work that you're doing tying up with Maharashtra's net zero commitments? And you know, in that regard, what support exists for MSMEs? You did mention how you know, the focus on innovation, of course, is being brought into every government department. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about that, and as I said, how you're sort of using that to sort of drive that policy perspective around net zero commitments. Sure. So uh, one uh, aspect, and uh, Smita and Tushar did uh, touch upon this, is the access to funding. 
and uh, we are probably one of those uh, few states that has uh, three uh, venture funds uh, in place. Um, now that's not uh, sector. Uh, I mean, it's not just for uh, clean tech startups, but that's uh, you know more uh, sector agnostics. So there's one social venture fund which is a 120 crore uh, fund. Uh, there's another fund which is uh, thematic and that focuses on uh, defense and aerospace, which is a very niche area. And in fact, one of the uh, MSME that was in that space recently listed on the uh, stock markets called as Paris Defense. And that's it. Mind you, that's a 330 crore fund with uh, an option to scale it up up to 1000 crores. So that's, you know, for a fund that's coming from the government, I would say that's a fairly large size. There's also another uh, 80 crore fund, which uh, focuses on um, MSMEs uh, coming from the backward uh, classes. So, uh, um, and going forward, the Innovation Society also plans to, while the three funds that I mentioned to you are by uh, MIDC, the Department of Industries, uh, the Innovation Society is also planning to launch um, a, a fund going forward. And the focus quite clearly would not be on the conventional set of startups, which, uh, to be honest, have a fair amount of access to capital in the current times with the private uh, players that are there. So we would look at sectors that don't have as much access to uh, you know, funding or have a longer uh, gestation uh, period. So I would say one uh, very important thing, and I think Tushar uh, highlighted on this aspect. So access to risk uh, capital is uh, is one thing that uh, we are uh, for, you know going to address and uh, number two i would say is to um, so when we started the innovation society we were the only ones uh, you know uh, talking about innovation and the need to have uh, more uh, more participation from the startups another issue we are trying to address uh, is that of procurement from startups so like all of us know uh, you know, uh, government uh, procurement across the country is not very favorable. Of course, there have been a lot of relaxations, uh, you know, in the last few years. It's not very favorable for startups because of various criteria uh, criterias that are used in tender. So we are trying to uh, relax some of that to see how, because startups very often don't have a prior benchmark. You know, there's their chances are they are disrupting something. So there's no technical specification or there's no prior benchmark to it. So it's always a challenge for procurement. So the idea what we are trying to do is, you know, through the startup week, we introduce them as a pilot and to see if these companies can be a larger part of procurement because the government can actually be a very large customer, especially for, you know, the kind of sectors uh, we are talking about. So that's one uh, policy initiative we are trying to see, to see how we can, to see how government can procure larger um, amounts or how startups can participate uh, in uh, larger government uh, procurement. So I would say these are two uh, very important uh, aspects that uh, we are looking at. Uh, Thanks, Mithun. I, again, I think a lot there to sort of come back to, um, but I'm just going to pause here right now because the work you're doing, of course, is fascinating and so needed. Um, Dr. Nankumar, just coming to you, would love to hear a little bit more from you from the coalition perspective. You know, this all of the changes that we've mentioned is going to require coordination on all fronts, whether it's businesses, CSOs, think tanks, the finance sector, of course. We're going to need alignment between the development and climate community to really deliver key signals to government as well. Um, what are you uh, sort of leading at the CII front in this regard? And where is sort of the real imperative for, for industry to step in? If you can talk a little bit to that. Thank you. Uh, I would say, first, I would like to look at the e ecosystem of the MSME. When you look at MSME, nearly 98% is micro, and their investment is maximum five crores as per MSME definition. So we are really looking at which are creating the uh, problems regarding pollution or emission system is primarily on the small and medium. And that small is more, really around the two, two and a half percent and medium is hardly 25,000 units. And medium also has their own challenges. So the industry bodies are taking care of the problem as a general. So in the case of micro, it's primarily it's a one man army or a two man army. And they do primarily service to a one or two or three large corporates as, a, uh, as an ancillary unit. The real uh, standalone units are the 
uh, I would say even the larger part of the small and uh, the medium scale. And that's where the challenge which is coming in the uh, pollution and pollution uh, really climate related areas, which government is addressing at various levels. I, everybody has spoken about all my pre panel colleagues uh, spoken about the various initiatives. I would say uh, a lot of initiatives is taken care of on the uh, climate control, climate funding, absolutely no issue. There are some areas which is uh, really uh, looking at, it is not really looking at the technology which is brought from overseas. How do we create the value in the country by re raising the R&D, research and development and continuous innovation, which is very, very essential because it cannot be a sustainable unit unless we have a continuous innovation. So government has focused on creating R&D into the country as well as um, continuous innovation. In fact, this is part of the, uh, I would say, various initiatives government has given to capital goods uh, uh, industry, capital goods sector, about out of the 33 sectors, capital goods is uh, driving the uh, anything what is required for setting up or running the industries. So capital goods sector is, has got real challenges in terms of the stress in terms of cash flow, but at the same time, Government is also looking at uh, R&D and in fact, industry association we have taken up with the government recently and it's a continuously we are taking up. Uh, there, uh, there was an incentive of around a 200% weighted average on the expenses incurred for R&D, R &D, which was taken out uh, by government around five, six years ago, uh, thinking that uh, there is some other incentive given to um, industry in terms of, um, uh, in terms of higher, uh, uh, depreciation or rather reduced income tax from 25% it is brought down to 17% for startup and small in, uh, regular industries and also from 33 to 25%. So government looking, but yet we have brought up this subject that um, we need to look at R&D as a focus area for uh, R&D, not necessarily on the product alone, but also accelerated R&D, which is contributing to the pollution or the climate conditions. And along with that, uh, to, uh, to imply the areas of uh, like carbon dioxide, the CO2 um, storage and development of CO2 cluster areas we can bring in, uh, CCS, carbon dioxide capture and storage. These are a couple of the areas where we have looked at the technology has to be developed and technology funding is there. There are various, uh, I would say each industry sector has tied up with uh, uh, industry as uh, academics like IITs or IASCs or large um, are uh, known uh, private universities in developing these technologies in order to bring in the um, cleaner technology, cleaner area at lower cost and uh, give it to the uh, small and medium sector micro, certainly they need to look at through the MIDs or IDCs, which in the various sector, which I am sure that that is working through IDC because Maharashtra Industrial Development Corporation itself has quite a large number of incentives, uh, both soft and hard. In the hard, of course, is the common facility centers, but in the soft, like uh, in the coming days, the competitiveness is coming from uh, digitalization. So they are looking at how digitalization can be supported even on the micro side by way of the support. And I believe up to 10 lakhs on the on the skill development or 10 lakhs on the soft, soft side uh, MIDC is giving is um, to startups as well as micro sectors in terms of um, uh, incentives. There are quite a lot of other incentives in terms of R&D side is government breaking up. We are also looking at the the, the gap we are looking at the government to fund it or government to help them uh, help the industries to have some taxation benefits by which uh, industry is able to sustain because both micro as well as small and large or small and medium has their own challenges in the cash flow as smitha said uh, uh, companies are or the banks are looking at cash flow based funding system but really cash flow based funding system also has uh, the, we have taken up their cash flow based along with the system and they also should look at collateral free funding or reduced collateral or if the collateral is available uh, in order to help the industries have the reduce the interest burden instead of having an mclr plus 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 can we have mclr plus one or two percent to uh, small and medium sector to enhance uh, their competitiveness as well as sustainability index so all the industry associations i would say is uh, very serious about the issues involved and knowledgeable about the knowledge and taking it up to not only government also the industrial um, development bodies uh, like uh, as the innovation center or other uh, industrial development uh, 
I would say, engineering institutes whereby they can fund it. So in my opinion, not only directly to the MSME or small and medium, but also to the nodal agency, which are uh, doing these research and development through IATs or I think they are also, we are trying to get that special funding is given to them in order to develop, develop the local technologies in terms of the cleaner, uh, cleaner, uh, clean technology and cleaner air, as well as mitigation in terms of eventual whatever the pollutions coming in order to reduce that. I would say the uh, waste management in, in terms of the local self governments. Quite a lot of work is being done, and we have uh, been working industry association with most of the local self governments, and also as part of the every every district one product for export we are also looking at that through this every district one product to get into global supply chain because in coming days any export certainly will look at what are the esg factors no industry can be in the global uh, global senior or global marketplace if they are not following the environments social and governance methods so we are looking at on, under this kind of the concept also how we can help industries to attain more clean more um, skill development as well as technology development in the country thank you thank you thank you dr nan kumar and you know thank you to all our panelists i think some of the key things that have already emerged are you know uh, firstly msmes need access to capital as well as customized financial products and they need you know a larger market for energy efficiency as well as investments in technology i think something else that came out very clearly was that we need to mobilize industry associations to make them aware of emerging clean technologies as well as of course the potential um, you know, of those technologies, and we have to arrange demonstrations as well for this purpose. Um, we've also discussed that MSMEs could benefit from, you know, technical institutions for skill development and training and a cluster service approach where you have local service providers or manufacturers in place, you know, to offer things like uh, technical, uh, technological supply or maintenance, awareness of new skills, et cetera, could really spur that uptake for MSMEs in when it comes to new technologies. Um, you know, a lot of really good sort of ideas and thoughts that are already on the table. Um, I want to sort of just ask all of the panelists before we go to audience Q&A, uh, just one sentence responses from each of you and we can start with you, Tushar. Um, what is your advice to the next generation of MSMEs or what is the one most pertinent sort of, you know, learning that you um, or takeaway that you would want to leave uh, for the next generation of entrepreneurs who are building out MSMEs in this country? With uh, one sentence, wow. Okay, I would say play the long game, take uh, ESG very, very seriously. Uh, it will be profitable, both, uh, uh, I think, environmentally, but also financially in the long run. Nice, nicely said. And thank you for yeah. sticking to the one sentence. Um, <laughs> I know that was tough. Thank you. Uh, Mithun, what about you? Well, I don't want to call it advice. MSME businessmen are smarter than I am. But uh, I would say adaptation to uh, newer technologies with the constant updates, uh, you know, that's happening. Okay. Also, um, well said. Thank you. And uh, Smita, you? I think, uh, you know, to integrate uh, sustainability and green considerations into the business strategy rather than view sustainability as an additional layer to their operations. So, you know, something to what uh, add to what Tushar so you know, look at clean technology with a long term viewpoint rather than as an additional burden on the books. Only then, you know, can there be a smooth transition. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. Um, Dr. Nand Kumar. Thank you. In my opinion, uh, MSME should have from the mindset of me and family to professional, which is very, very essential to sustain in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nankumar. We have some questions from the audience. Um, so I'm going to go to them now because they've obviously been furiously typing away in the chat. Um, the first question is, um, maybe you can come, you can come in on this. Um, are there any methods other than loans that can be utilized to help cover the challenge of end user financing for initial adoption of these renewable practices or tools? Since the question is more on initial adoption uh, and, and, you know, so loans can come in a little later because when, when a company is starting off, uh, you know, innovating and there is an initial uh, period 
then uh, either a, a grant based model or a, a venture capital backed model uh, something to like how uh, mithun was talking about i think those kind of uh, mechanisms will be more uh, beneficial and uh, see for a bank uh, the bank is interested in the numbers right i mean everybody is interested in numbers but a bank will look at what is the collateral what is the uh, are there cash flows it is sustainable or not all those things so to support an msme in the very very initial stage getting a loan will be difficult so these alternate mechanisms uh, like how some of my other panelists have discussed will kind of help thank you sita um next question is for you tushar um an audience member wants to know how we can ensure a just transition to greener operations especially for women yeah uh well i i uh, let me just tell you about how we've done it is uh when we when we were looking at solar refrigeration and uh we were you know looking across value chains that really made sense uh when we had when we uh, put on a gender lens uh we we had found uh, multiple value chains that had predominantly women working in it so one was that slide that i showed you of of uh, non timber forest produce which was uh, picking of uh, fruit like sita phal and jamun uh the other one that we saw and uh, closer to home in maharashtra was uh, goat milk uh this is around the sinar nasik area where we have worked with the community there where uh, there's a large goat population uh goat milk is priced in in larger cities it sells for north of 100 rupees a liter but there was no way to freeze it uh pasteurize it and and package it and on the coastal part of maharashtra there was a fish storage program so uh, what we try to do as a as an msme as a startup is is find value chains that are predominantly women driven and then enable them and solve their cold chain related issues so it's not uh, i i guess it's a somewhat different approach but uh, we still try and meet our, our gender smart targets by finding these uh, these value chains that are predominantly women just for example this um, fish value chain being predominantly women is not just a maharashtra thing we've done it in tanzania a similar thing men go out in fishing boats women retail the fish and uh, so we plug in where during the retail point and the storage of fish over there uh, so wherever it's uh, culturally socially uh, we find a women led value chain that's where we plug in with our cold chain thanks tushar um, i know that was a bit of a curveball but i think you answered it really well thank you um Mithun, I wanted to ask you a little bit about. Uh, actually, I have two questions for you uh, from the audience. The first is, um, can the credit packages and investment measures that have been announced, you know, can we use them to create local green enterprises at the decentralized level, um, specifically with regards to underdeveloped geographies? So, how do we really create, you know, in situ employment? I'm sure this is something you're already doing. but if you can talk a little bit about that you know in maharashtra that would be wonderful i am sorry sloka i didn't quite catch that one can you please come again so i the question was at the d de- i mean how are we sort of basically creating you know jobs in underdeveloped geographies using the investment measures and policy measures that have been announced um how are we ensuring that employment is taking place in more underdeveloped geographies in maharashtra Sorry. by starting uh, local green enterprises there yeah um, got it so i'll um, so i'll give you an answer but that's not specific to this green enterprise but i'll tell you what we are trying to do so uh, um we are the state's nodal agency and now it's a known fact that uh, 90% of the startups that are there in the state are in mumbai and pune uh, but when we have to look at it from the government's point of view you need to have a holistic ecosystem across the state Uh, so of uh, one of the largest projects that we have is to set up incubation centers across the state to support early stage startups and of the 17 that we have uh, just three of them are in mumbai and pune the other 14 are across the state in places like nasik akola amravati nanded so on and so forth and the idea being you know any youngster that wants to start up should have access to these kind of facilities as and when he or she decides to uh, do 
too. So that, so that I, I would say is a very important aspect. Now it's a different matter that you know at a later point when he or she scales up, the business might move to a Mumbai or Pune. But we, what we want to ensure is uh, you know when they start, you know there needs to be access to the right amount of uh, resources. Um, the uh, so another area what uh, we are doing is uh, now in the in the startup week. Uh, for example, while uh, a lot of startups are based in Mumbai or Pune, they are uh, focused markets are elsewhere. You know, it could be deeper in the uh, districts. For example, uh, there's uh, there's a startup called as Taral Tech, which has built uh, a reactor that's fit into water pumps. You know, your hand pumps, and and what it does is it it eliminates any kind of microbial uh, microorganisms that are there in the water in the water. So we are trying to give access to such startups where although they are based out of you know Mumbai or Pune, but the deployment needs to be done in in a remote in a tier two or a tier three. So there we come in and we uh, work closely with these startups, facilitate uh, for them to uh, connect with the various district uh, level offices to make sure that's that's done. Uh, another startup which. Um, you know, I'd like to talk about is somebody like an S4S, which makes solar dryers. And uh, so uh, very similar to what Tushar, Tushar is, uh, not similar, but somewhere along those lines where, you know, they make solar dryers and it's given to women uh, self-help groups. And then there's a buyback arrangement. So these are various uh, ways in which we are trying to address this. I may just add- Thank uh, you. On this. Yes, of course, Dr. Yeah. Nankumar, please. Yes. As a one product, one district scheme under Niti Aayog, they have selected under 330 districts in developing these products as well as also incubating the entrepreneurs for to come up to that level. So that's a great initiative done by Niti Aayog, Niti Aayog across uh, 330 districts they have taken now. I am sure that will certainly catch up on the employment generation about the about the official areas in uh, each because it is a district focus. It is not even a state focus. So it is a, it's a great initiative by Niti Aayog. Thank you, Dr. Nand Kumar. Um, in fact, the next question was going to be for you as well. Uh, what is What skilling opportunities do you see, particularly with informal sector workers in the MSME sector? That's one question we've gotten. Uh, I would say, uh, under national skill development centers, there are various skill uh, potential is there, which of course so far has been centered around the state capitals or districts, but now government also has um, taken that into even villages uh, into that skill area, depending upon the potential of the particular district or particular village they are looking at. It is not necessarily conventional engineering or technology areas, but as Mithun said, what is focused on the particular district, how to create the uh, skill areas. And in that, some of the skill development initiatives is also to tie down to some of the large industries or a medium industry, which are in that particular area, create as a create as an innovation center for creating skill as well as the product. And, and I would say even the school, curriculum areas in the curriculum itself, also creating an vocational courses. Today, what has happening our curriculum has been purely in academic. Now, a lot of focus as per the new education policy has come that vocational courses has been put into. So that is that is, will drive certainly this uh, uh, creation of the employment or creation of the skills in the areas, vocational program in the new environment, uh, new educational policy, which is just launched last year. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Yeah. Of course, please come in. Yeah. Yeah, Shraka, just a thought. Uh, so again, skilling needs money, right? So uh, uh, so this is where I think, you know, corporate uh, citizenship budgets or the CSR, as we all know, it can come in. And uh, so a lot of companies are having skilling and livelihoods as one of their, uh, you know, focus areas. Uh, uh, so I think directing it towards these, uh, directing corporate CSR money uh, towards these areas is, uh, is, you know, in one way in which, you know, this kind of, this can be scaled. Thanks, Mr. That's a great point. point. Yes, of course. As a, as a skilling initiative, even um, CIS has taken up that is differently abled people for uh, skilling in digital areas. It is started in a big way across the various states now. I'm sure that over the coming two years, that will be a great initiative for uh, people with uh, I, uh, 
Pardon me if I said differently able, but I just want to point out for uh, differently abled people that initiatives are being taken up in, in a much wider space. No, well, that's wonderful to hear, Mr. Uh, Dr. Nand Kumar. That's actually a great point. Thank you for mentioning that as well. Um, Tushar, this one's for you. Um, other than pollution management, our audience member wants to know, it, you know, other than pollution management, energy efficiency, as well as greener supply chain, what are stakeholders thinking on sustainable res resourcing of raw materials? Yeah, so, I think, uh, sure, yeah, sorry, ahead. this is right up your alley. Yeah, I think that look over here, I think people are, uh, we are always thinking about, uh, recycling and the circular economy when it comes to components when it comes to uh, parts when it comes to building uh, uh, our products so for example uh, if i focus on solar refrigerators uh, what we're trying to do is uh, you know be be as clean as we can when it comes to refrigerants so we'd go higher up uh, the r table towards r 600s Etc. to make uh, make our refrigerant as clean as possible. Um, we also, uh, there's a lot of work being done right now on uh, used electric vehicle batteries. So electric vehicle batteries that, um, that possibly for a Tesla or an Audi or something would be uh, replaced at an 80% depth of discharge or 75% depth of discharge. Those are still really good, really useful to be uh, to be deployed in a solar scenario, in an off-grid solar scenario like uh, solar refrigeration. So uh, that's something we're also exploring and working on uh, uh, quite actively. Um, it's, it's, it's circular, it's good, it's greening, uh, and again, it's cost effective. So it, it all has to plug in together. So I think that um, Component sourcing needs to be done again long term, and uh, there are now in India uh, a number of uh, recycling agencies that have been certified by several state pollution control boards. Uh, we are already realizing the the risks of too much uh, lead acid battery, too many lithium batteries. What do we do with them? Uh, there's a there's a few agencies in Bangalore that are now safely disposing them. Uh, short adds cost. But um, I think in the long run, recycling, reusing is, is really the key. Thanks, Ajar. Really appreciate that. Um, OK, I think actually we're, we're almost done. So I'm going to end with each of the panelists once again. And this is a request. If you can keep your answers just short of 60 seconds. Um, I'd love for you to just sum up you know, one key takeaway from today's session each. And um, Mithun, maybe we can start with you. Um, so EST and uh, every other trend that we are talking of uh, is here to stay. It's it's uh, not a matter of if. It's a more it's more a matter of when. And uh, I mean, we are already seeing it happening, and it's very important. And uh, both you and Dr. Nanda Kumar spoke about the contribution that. MSMEs have to the uh, to the economy, and I'm sure that numbers only here to grow. So I'm, I'm sure there's these are ex exciting times to be in going forward. Thanks, Mithun. I think we all share your enthusiasm. Um, Sita, over to you. Yeah. So there are many SM MSMEs in the country who are championing the cause of sustainability, and this will only see a further boom, you know, in the near future, owing to more and more large companies uh, giving importance to their supply chains. And it will become extremely important for MSMEs to go by the triple bottom line of those, you know, investing in green technology, intelligent IT systems, developing sustainable finance products. And also, as I mentioned earlier, integrating sustainability within the core business strategy is extremely critical rather than looking at it as a feel good factor or an additional layer to the operations. And I believe that the financial sector can potentially play a significant role uh, through innovative financing and focused product development whilst also addressing a more primary concern of MSMEs, you know, being unable to access mainstream uh, financing. And uh, there is scope for financial institutions in collaboration with appropriate government agencies, uh, civil society, multi multilateral funding, uh, DFIs, et cetera, to kind of innovate products for MSMEs. 
and you know trigger a process of clean integration uh, in the segment. Uh, so I'd like to close with that. Uh, thanks, Luka. You've been a great moderator. And thank you very much for uh, to the Sankalp and uh, Purpose Teams for having me here. Thanks, Mitha. We've, we've really appreciated your taking the time to be with us today, all of you. Uh, Dr. Nand Kumar, over to you, your key takeaway. Thank you, Ms. Nath. The coming years, no doubt, the future is certainly depend on the three words of ESG, environment, society, and governance. Whether it is micro, small, or medium, or large, they have to focus on this in order to sustain in the global ecosystem. So I am fully with all of uh, my fellow panelists as well as uh, the organizers on this. And I, it's a real time uh, up, 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 up time up for this, this session on the environment, safety, and governance. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity to all the industry association, me personally. Thank you. And it's nice meeting all my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nand Kumar. Tushar, you have the last words. Yeah, sure. So I, uh, I think I'll echo what most people said that ESG has got to be part of your core strategy. It can't be an afterthought. It can't be like part of a CSR charitable budget kind of thing. It has, it's, it's, it's your DNA. It's who you are. And uh, my, my words of advice, if I may, is uh, for MSMEs to plug into the system. There is a lot of support that exists. Um, you know, I hope that, uh, the ecosystem comes together with affordable finance. Uh, and also I would encourage the government uh, to really encourage uh, early adopters of new green technology that can be scaled in the future. So that, thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. Thank you, Tushar. And thank you to all our panelists. I think what's clear from this discussion today is that India's MSMEs are the backbone of its industrial transition. They are a significant source of emissions. There is a weak you know, reg reg regulatory link, but it's going to need all hands on deck, as well as, of course, mainstream finance to address their transition management. Um, but the opportunity is huge because a green transition for Indian industry can contribute not just to the country's environmental goals, but to its industrial competitiveness. I think that came out very clearly from our discussion today. And of course, you know, decarbonizing MSMEs is going to require a combination of fiscal and technology policy, market creation, supply chain security, and crucially, as you have all mentioned again and again, finance. Um, so this shift for India is going to require overcoming, you know, a number of barriers, not just in technology, but also in our political economy. Um, but, you know, we can collaborate with the private sector to leverage opportunities, you know, whether it's the new technological revolution um, or, um, you know, uh, opportunities in finance and financial instruments to build back better. Designing a green industrial policy is going to be an exercise in transition management and, of course, as always, in embracing uncertainty. Thank you all for being here with us today, for sharing your afternoon with us. Thank you for your questions to our audience. Thank you for your interest, your engagement. A special thank you to our panelists, you know, for sharing all your wonderful thoughts and ideas, as well as ambitions on building Maharashtra and India's MSME future. We really appreciate your time and effort. And of course, none of this would have been possible without Sankalp, as well as the Purpose team. So a very, very warm thank you to all of you that were instrumental in bringing this event to life and thank you to for inviting me to moderate it as we progress onward from here i think we can all see the magnitude of the task that lies before us yet the current of this conversation today has been resonant with hope i think what i've really heard over and over is the dreams of a new energy future and the routes that can take us there we are here on the brink you know of a crisis that does threaten uh, the social fabric of our nation, but we are also overflowing with ambition and hope. And so it's really a challenge. Um, I, I do believe we can overcome. Thank you once again. Thank you again to my panelists and hope you all have a wonderful day ahead.